So welcome to our Spring Sustainability Seminar Series. I'm Kishore Rajagopalan, Associate Director of the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. For those of you who are new or joining us over the web, the mission of the center is to advance sustainable practices, reduce pollution, and enhance human and environmental health. We are one of five surveys organized within the Prairie Research Institute. The Institute, through its objective integrated research, seeks to ensure sustainable economic development, enduring environmental quality, and cultural resource preservation for the people, businesses, and governments of Illinois. The goal of this Spring Sustainability Seminar Series is to listen to various perspectives on sustainability related issues in Illinois. We have encouraged our speakers to articulate their priorities, perceived needs, opportunities, and ongoing work to stimulate broader collaboration and to find common ground. I'm pleased to welcome today's speaker, Margaret Guerrero, the Director of the Land and Chemical Division, Region 5 US EPA. She has overall responsibility for regional implementation of several EPA program areas, including the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, the Toxic Substances Control Act, the Pollution Prevention Program, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, Underground Storage Tanks, and Leaking Underground Storage Tanks Program, the Toxic Release Inventory, and the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. The division also has responsibility for the regional children's health program. Most recently, Ms. Guerrero spent a year working in two different assignments at EPA headquarters in Washington, D.C. She served as a deputy office director for the Office of Resource Conservation and Recovery and later as a deputy assistant administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation. Ms. Guerrero has previously served as a Deputy Division Director in the Superfund Division in the Chicago office. Margaret's management responsibilities in this program included the Superfund, Superfund Program, the Brownfields Program, and the Oil Pollution Act Program. She has also served as Chief of the Region's Emergency Response Branch, as well as the Director of the Air and Radiation Division. Margaret is a native of Chicago and a graduate of the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, where she earned a degree in geology. Margaret and her husband have three daughters who have also attended the University of Illinois. Her youngest daughter, is it Sophia? Okay, Sophia will graduate from the University in May in Global Studies, right? Okay. So before we get started, a couple of housekeeping points. The restrooms are in the hallway across the reception and through the door to my right. And in case of an emergency, please stand up and follow my directions. And with that, Margaret, it's all yours. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, Delighted to be here. It's always great to come back to the campus and uh, talk about a really uh, important uh, topic and one that's near and dear to, to my heart. Um, and it's nice to have my daughter to be able to see me um, give the presentation. Uh, so when I was asked to do the presentation, I sat down with my staff to talk a little bit about what we might want to talk about because um, this is actually an interesting question about how EPA is implementing sustainability into our programs because as a lot of you know, EPA has been around for over 40 years and we are primarily and have been historically a regulatory program. And so many people both outside the agency and inside the agency um, questioned whether this was, there was a role for EPA in um, sustainability. And uh, if, there, if there is, where is it? You know, how does 
sustain how, how does implementing sustainability um, mesh with enforcing regulation? Um, so we, you can imagine there was quite a bit of internal and external conversation. Um, we've had long-standing programs like the Pollution Prevention Program that uh, has worked in many of the concepts, worked, worked with many of the concepts of sustainability. Um, but some of the other programs um, took a little bit longer to really get their arms around what sustainability uh, means in, in those program areas. So we decided with a nod to Mr. Letterman, who since I put this talk together, is retiring now, so I have to do a new one with a Stephen Colbert uh, flair maybe next time. But um, we decided that we would do the top 10 things that EPA is uh, doing to um, incorporate sustainability into our programs at the EPA. Okay, so our mission is pretty broad. It's to protect the air, um, water, and land. And as I said, we've been around for a long time, and we're primarily regulatory. So um, in 2010, our previous administrator, Mr. Jackson, asked the National Academy of Sciences to look at this question of what is EPA's role uh, with respect to sustainability. And in uh, 2011, uh, the National Academy of Sciences um, put out this report on sustainability in the US EPA, and that is the link um, to the study and to um, their findings. But the good news is that they agreed that EPA should uh, play a major role in uh, sustainability uh, in the country. This is our current administrator, Gina McCarthy, who I actually worked for when I was in Washington, D.C. Great lady. Um, really smart and um, working really hard on um, lots of things for the administration. Um, one of the things that she's done is put out the EPA's um, strategy for or strategic plan for 2014 to 2018, and in it, it very clearly talks about um, the role that EPA plays in sustainable in a sustainable future, and these are the four areas that um, are outlined in that plan. Um, for EPA's work. So we're going to start with our top 10 um, things. And so the, top, the number 10 thing that EPA is doing is advancing the development of sustainable products and supporting green purchasing activities. And I want to give you three examples of how we're doing this. The first one is design for the environment. Are you familiar with this um, program? OK, so this is a program for those of you who aren't, that um, identifies ways to um, reduce the toxicity of consumer products and works with um, producers and uh, manufacturers to do that. Um, this is the, the label that you see on the product. If um, this doesn't point to it, well, there's the design for the environment label. And um, you've probably seen there's a few products that actually advertise that when they have commercials on TV with that they are designed for the environment for, um, approved. Um, so right now we have about 2,500 products that have this label and each year we are adding more products uh, to that. Another thing that we're doing is um, the Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge. So green chemistry is the design of um, products and processes that reduce or eliminate the use of chemicals um, and hazardous uh, substances. And so the uh, Green Chemistry Challenge is to kind of challenge um, folks to come up with ways to reduce or eliminate uh, toxic aspects of um, products. And um, the, these Green Chemistry Challenge Awards are highly sought after and highly competitive. And they recognize the chemical technologies that incorporate green um, principles into the design and manufacturing use of products. Um, so the results here on the slide are for um, through 2013, from the inception of this program through 2013. You can see that there is uh, quite a um, large amount of recovery of or, uh, the recovery of hazardous chemicals and uh, reduction of water and energy use. The last one I want to cover is the comprehensive procurement guidelines. 
this is actually, this was mandated by a presidential executive order to federal government so that they have to incorporate green purchasing um, into their procurement of goods and services in the federal government. And um, so it promotes the use of materials that have been recovered from the waste stream. Uh, it requires recycled content for the products that are identified. And um, EPA has the responsibility to identify the, the products. And as of now, there are 61 <laughs> products in about eight different categories that the federal government is required to purchase um, in their purchasing uh, processes. Okay, moving on. So the, the number nine way <laughs> EPA is taking a holistic approach um, to protecting valuable water resources. Um, and we are working to incorporate sustainability into our mission to protect water. And in, in this region, the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River Basin are the two major um, watersheds that um, we work on. And so on Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, um, recently there has been over $1.4 billion invested in um, protecting and restoring the Great Lakes. And um, many of these things incorporate many of the projects, it's been about 2,000 projects funded with this money, and many of these projects <coughs> incorporate um, sustainability into them. And one project, um, for example, um, over 130,000 pounds of hazardous waste were removed from the watershed in the Lake Superior uh, watershed. Um, we're also um, implementing innovative ways to prevent runoff. Um, some of you may be aware of these kinds of best management practices. Um, the urban runoff from construction sites and other areas, um, as well as, as uh, rural runoff, creates um, issues for water because of the uh, sed contaminated sediments or just sediments in general running um, off the land when the land is disturbed. Um, and so we have been working to identify best management practices using um, things that might have otherwise ended up as waste. Um, and so you can see here, this is um, a filter sock that's filled with um, compost material. And uh, you may have seen some of these things on the roadways and more larger because the departments of transportation use these kinds of uh, things uh, quite often uh, now. Uh, the last thing about water that I wanted to mention is water sense, and I learned that um, the uh, center is a uh, water fence member, and I um, wanted to uh, congratulate you on your current, on your new initiative for the one billion dollar one million gallon sorry one billion gallon <laughs> initiative uh, for water. So um, the water fence for those of you that aren't familiar is similar to Energy Star, which is much more um, familiar to a lot of people, where um, water um, so products that save water, reduce water consumption, um, get the water sense label and then requirements um, for them to get that. Okay, the number eight way the EPA is implementing the president, sorry, implementing sustainability is through the president's um, climate action plan. And I'm not going to say a lot about climate change and what we're doing at EPA because that um, could be a whole nother hour or longer talk. Um, but suffice it to say that in the President's Actions Plan, uh, he calls on EPA to do a number of things and uh, primarily uh, working to cut carbon pollution um, by setting fuel standards, regulating carbon pollution, controlling greenhouse gas emissions, and promoting energy efficiency. And um, I will talk about those things under other areas of this talk, but just to um, talk a little bit about fuel economy standards. Um, this is an area that EPA um, has the primary responsibility. And one of the things that we are currently working on is uh, um, putting together fuel economy standards that for the 20, 25, 2025 uh, time frame that will require that uh, cars get 55 miles per gallon on average um, by the year 2020. So obviously this kind of thing is going to cut really the tons of carbon. What was it? 55 mil, uh, miles per gallon. 
Um, <coughs> that's the rhymes that are being written now. Um, so I was, so the um, this kind of program cuts billions of tons of carbon and um, saves money and also our dependency on foreign oil. Okay, the seventh way that EPA is using principles of sustainability is through developing tools to promote energy conservation. I mentioned Energy Star. Um, if you can, as you can see, the result is prevented 1.8 million metric tons of greenhouse gases and saved more than $230 billion uh, in construction. So another way that EPA is working to promote energy conservation is through the E3 program. Um, this was initially called the E2 program, and it's, it's uh, uh, evolved into E3, which is economy, energy, and environment. Um, and this is a program that is uh, puts together a framework involving a number of different federal agencies that come together to work with um, manufacturers in communities. So it's geographically focused, and the different agencies bring different things to the table, including technical assistance and um, financial resources to uh, groups of industry in a, in a given community and help um, with um, reduce their energy consumption, help protect and um, preserve environment and, and conserve resources, and then um, impact the bottom line for these companies. And um, I know that we have been working on V3, and um, let's see what the, uh, I'm not sure that the time frame that you have been working with um, industry, but this is the result of my gap of telling that you guys have achieved so far. So very impressive um, numbers for the work that um, the center is doing on uh, uh, E3 with, with the different Illinois manufacturers in different areas. Okay, so um, the sixth way that we are implementing um, sustainability in our programs is through a variety of programs to reduce landfill methane emissions. Um, obviously, lots of landfills around. Um, we have tried to develop technologies. We've worked with a lot of uh, different centers to develop technologies that can capture methane from existing landfills. Uh, and we have the landfill um, Landfill Methane Outreach Program that helps uh, communities deal with these on an ongoing basis. But the idea really is to try and avoid sending things to landfills that are going to end up creating methane. So we are focused on a couple of ways to try and avoid that. Um, many of you might be familiar with the food recovery hierarchy and the top thing to do um, to avoid food waste going to <laughs> landfills is um, source reduction. And EPA has launched the Food Recovery Challenge. Um, we are in our second year of that challenge. We've signed up a number of um, companies and uh, municipalities to help us um, deal with the um, problem of food going to landfills. Um, I think I heard a figure of this, about 36 million tons of food waste generated um, in a year in the United States that doesn't end up being um, consumed and goes to landfills. And um, in our first year in, in uh, the Chicago, in the Midwest area, we have um, signed up for participants that have diverted more than 70,000 tons of uh, wasted food from landfills. And um, either by finding places where the food can be consumed or by reducing the amount of food that is delivered or um, working to do composting or other uses of the food before it gets, um, before it ends up in the land. Another area that we're working on and promoting is anaerobic digestion. And here this is um, a process where the, um, the um, food is put into a digester and used um, to capture the methane gas and create a fuel, and the fuel is used to um, and for energy for 
in some cases it's municipalities, so it goes into the grid. In other cases I've seen where they have them out um, on farms, and so the farm ends up being able to use the energy that's um, created from this process, and it keeps the methane producing uh, waste out of landfills. Okay, so then um, another way that EPA has incorporated sustainability in our work is in our um, response to disasters. Um, one of the jobs that we do on an ongoing basis is respond to emergencies and disasters, either naturally occurring or man-made. And um, as you can imagine, there's a significant amount of debris that is created in um, these kinds of situations. And um, one of the things that we realized after Katrina was that all of that debris was going to the landfill. And it actually ended up um, really severely limiting their ability to um, their, their space left or their capacity left in the landfill after all the material went there. And almost none of it was recycled or diverted away from the landfill. So following that, um, we developed a, um, a way to <laughs> identify debris and um, categorize it and then identify um, companies that, we, that the waste could be diverted to in a disaster. So there's a database for every area that identifies um, composters, metal recyclers, um, other places that take materials and reuse them so that things don't end up all going to the landfill in a, in a uh, emergency situation. So it's the Disaster Debris Net Recovery Network, and um, it has about 3,500, in, in the Illinois area, there's about 3,500 um, companies identified that can manage different kinds of um, debris that comes from these kinds of disasters. Um, and I haven't been mentioning, but I've been trying to put the website on each one of these slides when there is one that you can go to to get more information. Okay, so um, EPA is also taking a sustainable approach to um, cleaning up contaminated um, sites in our Superfund program and our River Corrective Action program and our tank cleanup program and also in the redevelopment of um, land after we've cleaned it up. So um, this is just a little excerpt of what's at this, on this web page here, but it's green remediation. And we, uh, what we do is we try to consider all the different aspects of the cleanup in ways that we can um, make them greener and have a smaller footprint um, during the process of cleaning up the site. This is an example of a site where these tanks were um, cleaned. But they had hazard waste in them, but they were cleaned out, and the metal was recycled um, rather than sent to a hazardous waste landfill, which is what would have happened in the past. Another example: um, more than 90% of the material that was generated during the cleanup was um, diverted from the landfill and recycled. So it was about 325,000 pounds of metals and about a 125 cubic yards of uh, concrete that was um, used, reused, sent off site, and not um, sent to a landfill. Another thing that the agency has done is um, started a, a Repowering American Land initiative. And this is a initiative that promotes putting um, re renewable fuel sorry, renewable energy facilities on cleaned up sites. So once a site is cleaned up, um, the idea is that you want to redevelop that site so that the community doesn't have a blighted, albeit cleaned up, um, site that was at one point a uh, contaminated area. So we have started an initiative to try and get these sites to be redeveloped as uh, alternative uh, energy facilities. And this is an example of one in Chicago. And um, it's a 41-acre site. This is the before, this is the after. So it's a, a solar-powered um, um, installation. And the power goes back to the, the Chicago grid. And it's used by the city. But the idea is to encourage um, former 
how many properties for each one. Okay, so the number three way that EPA uh, uses the principle of sustainability in our work is um, by working to incorporate and support sustainable communities. In um, 2009, the um, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Department of Transportation, and the U.S. EPA um, created the Partnership for Sustainable Communities. And what this is is a, um, a uh, initiative that helps communities have access to affordable housing, um, increase public transportation, and environmental protection in, um, in a particular community. And there's a lot of tools and um, best management practices and technical assistance available through this program. And um, you can find more about this on the website, but I'm going to show you a couple of things. One of the things that we've done in our region is develop a um, plan, uh, pamphlet or instruction on how to um, demolish homes for reuse. So one of the big issues in communities, particularly after the um, economic downturn in 2008-2009, is abandoned property. And um, cities want to demolish and take these properties down so that they can reuse the land or put the land into a land bank for future use. And they um, have a problem when they come to take the house down because they, there's less paint, there's asbestos, and there's a lot of materials that could be diverted away from a landfill. Um, so we are working to, with these communities to give them instruction on how to deal with the contamination material and how to um, divert the non-contaminated material uh, from landfills to be reused. So um, this is part of the, uh, if you go to the other website, this will be on there. But this is also the website for this particular tool. And um, it's been very helpful to communities around the Midwest. And one example, in uh, Cincinnati, from 20 homes that they demolished, they were able to um, salvage about 3,000 um, feet, square feet of um, pine flooring, so really nice and deep pine flooring, and about 1,000 square feet of the tin, the antique tin ceiling. So those are actually quite valuable. People want those in their homes, and they were able to salvage those um, for use. Sorry, I was expecting a different slide. Um, this is another way um, that we are helping communities improve and helping them to be more sustainable. This is an example of green infrastructure. The um, area on the right is a, um, I think it's outside of Cabora, Illinois, and it's a um, an area that's sort of a, a man-made wetland that holds water after storm events and allows it to slowly uh, work its way into the ground as opposed to it running off and having to be collected in a, a storm sewer system. Um, and this area here is in Naperville, I believe, and it's, uh, it's got the swale, the vegetative swale in between the parking lot. And also you notice right here there's a cut curve so that the water can run out of the parking lot into the vegetative. And these are, this is an example of the kinds of things that we are helping communities um, learn about and implement um, to be more sustainable. Okay, the number two way that EPA focuses and brings sustainability to their work is through the Pollution Prevention Program. And uh, I think I mentioned earlier, this program has been around for a long time, I think it was 1990s. Um, that it was um, passed into law, and um, this was probably the first place in the agency where the concepts and the principles of sustainability were being applied um, to our work. And it has um, continued to evolve, this program. It, it, it now uh, looks a lot more at things like green chemistry and sustainability than it did when it started, and um, it's um, 
encompass as many of the things that I've already talked about uh, today, which is um, conserving resources, reducing um, toxicity of products, project, uh, yeah, products and um, reusing materials. And um, I just wanted to go into a little bit about the kinds of things that can be achieved through our grants. We, uh, one of our basic elements of our program is we give out C2 grants. We give one to the center um, to help others with uh, C2 issues in their um, facilities. And this is an example of what we've been able to do or what our grantees have been able to do uh, in the past year. So these are numbers from 2012 to 2013. Um, so they're pretty impressive uh, here. The, uh, the number of gallons conserve the 6.5 million is, is equivalent to about what about 650 people use annually uh, with respect to water in their homes. So it's a pretty significant amount of um, savings that we've made here in the Midwest. Um, and the um, 55.9 thousand metric tons of carbon equivalent is equal to about taking 13,000 cars off the road. So. Um, and I wanted to point out the center's um, results from the work that they do. <coughs> okay, so um, the last area that I wanted to talk about today is the number one way that EPA is incorporating sustainability into its program, and that is by moving from a waste management focus to a sustainable materials management focus. And um, this um, sustainable materials management continues to emphasize recycling and reuse, but it incorporates um, life cycle analysis into our thinking and um, in the way we make decisions. So I'm going to provide some examples of what we we're doing, but I wanted to first talk a little um, briefly about the state of municipal solid waste and um, recycling and recovery. The, depending on way, how you look at this, the good news is that we recycle um, 30, almost 35% of the municipal solid waste in this country. Um, the bad news is that um, there's quite a bit that still is being um, discarded and um, disposed of. So um, I noticed that it's got the same uh, pie chart in here and we hope it but on the left, this is um, what's being recycled. So the majority of it is the paper and paperboard. And um, the other things that make up the recycling totals are not here on the right is um, what's still being discarded by category. And you can see food waste, which I've already touched on, um, is a big area. Plastic, we got a lot of, um, I had a tour of the facility before the talk. And talked a lot about ways in which um, plastics are being looked at, um, try and divert them from landfills and reuse them, reuse the material. But there's plenty of opportunities, I think, as you can see, for additional um, materials to be diverted from uh, landfilling. This is a life cycle, this is an example of a life cycle approach, and it basically starts with resource extraction, materials processing, and just moves through um, the life cycle of a product or of a material. And it, um, it sort of shows when you look at something this way, it gives you a different perspective on how, where, there's a, where are there problems, where is the footprint large, and um, what kind of things you can uh, do about it. Um, one of the, I'd like to show an example of this because it's hard to talk about um, without talking specifically. So I wanted to give you an example of a life cycle assessment that was done by a uh, international um, a laundry detergent company. So they started out by um, looking at all of the different parts of this process for their product. And um, they looked at energy and materials used, inputs from manufacturing, they looked at packaging, looked at transportation, and they also looked at usage by the consumer. So 
so once the material, once the laundry detergent got to the consumer's home. And what was interesting is um, we found out that this was the biggest problem uh, by far in the whole life cycle. It was because the detergent was supposed to be used with hot water. And so what they did is they went and designed a, a product for cold, for cold water and completely changed their um, footprint and uh, completely changed the results of their life cycle analysis. And the other thing that they were surprised about was packaging was the second worst thing. So you, you would have sort of guessed that maybe it was the actual toxicity of the product or some other uh, manufacturing point that would have been the worst uh, part of the life cycle analysis, but it turned out that the home use of hot water and the amount of packaging that they were using were the two biggest problems that they had in their, with their product life cycle. So, Uh, with that in mind, we are um, focusing our program, our sustainable materials management efforts, on providing <coughs> seed money to innovation and creating best practices, um, facilitate information sharing, and then um, promoting voluntary initiatives and, and recognizing people that are working for sustainable materials management. And I want to give you a couple of examples of the things that we're doing. Um, in 2009, we gave the seed money uh, through a grant to um, the Rebuilding Exchange in Chicago. Is anybody familiar with this facility? It was the first one of its kind, um, still the leader, in um, taking those building materials that I was talking about where they're being reclaimed and um, creating a, a place for people to come and purchase those uh, salvage materials. And um, they also train people in how to do deconstruction and how to do um, how to use the materials that they have um, for resale. So they, um, to date, they've diverted thousands of tons of building materials from landfills. They've also um, trained a lot of people in lots of different cities so that they have been able to open their own uh, rebuilding exchanges. And um, we currently have interest from um, a couple of cities in Ohio to do um, one of these as well. Um, Byproduct Synergy is another um, grant that we gave. Actually, we've given more than one grant, but in, in the Midwest, we've given a couple, one in Chicago, one in Ohio. And um, basically what this is is taking the waste stream from one facility and making it the feedstock for another facility. So um, we are matching up businesses that can use one business's waste for their and um, this has been very successful. As you can imagine, it's very, uh, it can be very complex, and it's very local. Because the, obviously, the businesses have to be uh, very closely uh, located, and they sometimes have to change their processes to um, help match their waste with what the feedstock for the other facility is. And um, so, we have uh, funded the Chicago Waste of Profit Network in the past, and um, they had over 300 partners, and um, they diverted about 150,000 tons of waste and um, saved about $17 million by uh, coming up with synergistic relationships um, and working together to um, divert waste. Um, we've also funded a demonstration projects. Sorry, so the slide. Um, demonstration projects um, for reusing asphalt singles in um, asphalt for roads, and this has been very successful, and is now um, being used by Minnesota and Illinois Department of Transportation. Um, they recycle shingles and use them in um, building roads. But uh, so this is the kinds of projects that we are very excited about that we help seed money and we help tell a uh, story once um, they're able to uh, successfully complete these kinds of things. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is our electronics challenge. Um, it's a fairly new challenge and it, it promotes the responsible recycling of electronics. 
Um, why I'm really excited about this is, is because we have the largest electronic manufacturers um, in the world, I guess, that have signed on to a three-year challenge to um, do 100% of their recycling um, with approved recyclers through a third-party uh, certification process, which um, has some very stringent requirements, one of which is um, not sending the electronics overseas, um, which I know a lot of uh, people have a lot of concerns about when, when that was happening. So, um, but people like Best Buy and Dell and uh, Samsung and Sony and Sprint have all signed up for this challenge. So, um, this is a national challenge with EPA and um, we're very excited to see how that comes out. And um, so that is the top 10 ways that EPA has incorporated sustainability into our work. And um, of course, we are very interested in supporting a green economy and um, making sure that, um, like the center, every, everything that we can do to uh, prevent uh, materials from our toxic materials from getting into the environment and being disposed in landfills. And, um, and I would just continue to work with partners like the center and others to um, push things forward. So, and happy Earth Day, everybody, and thank you very much. For talking about the food waste, Jim mentioned uh, some different companies, uh, right, what kind of groups are you working with? But yeah. on, on the food recovery challenge? Yeah. So um, we have Kroger Groceries, it's our, our largest grocery store, um, and they have lots of different um, facilities. And uh, we also have municipalities, we have um, universities, other institutions that, um, like schools that have um, food that is, um, you know, not used or delivered daily. And then our biggest um, outside of Kroger is um, stadiums and events like convention centers like uh, the McCormick Place and um, we have the Sox and not the Cubs, the Sox and um, the Cleveland and Cincinnati. So a lot of the, we have a lot of sports facilities in the in the region. And, and so would they then um, just composting the food waste or would they be reducing the so, okay, there's, a, there's different things. Obviously, we'd like them to be reusing the food. First of all, not bringing more food than we need to um, in the first place, but um, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can find you the numbers. The, um, the, the next thing is to actually bring it to people that, need, that are in need of food. So, um, 24, so I said 70,000 tons were um, diverted. 24,000 of those tons were donated to Feed Hungry People, and um, 46,000 tons were diverted to composting. So. In your uh, numbers, have you Mm -hmm. I think it's great that EPA has come up with these uh, labels for uh, science and mm -hmm. uh, I've had a lot of trouble with some federal agencies getting them to comply with uh, environmental preferences and procurements. And mm -hmm. it's great that EPA is doing this, but I just want to see you know, what your experience has been uh, in terms of actually you know, getting by it particularly from the guys that were back in the world country. Yeah. Right, so I just, my regulatory mindset just clicked in and said, oh, we should probably take some enforcement actions against other federal agencies. Okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> we do sometimes have trouble. Um, we try to educate, we try to outreach and educate to them. Um, one, uh, in particular, when the stimulus package came through and there were a lot of federal agencies putting a lot of money out uh, through grants and things, we tried really hard to get um, their attention and to put those requirements into their grants and contracts because they are required to pass them down to those that are receiving 
uh, funds. Um, but yeah, it is, it's not everybody is as aware of those uh, requirements as they should be. Um, so actually, I think on the way home about how I might do a better job of getting the word out. Um, you may have covered this, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the presentation, but um, a topic recently was raised uh, from the, a recent EPA report regarding embedded emissions from our stock. And of course the university annually does a carbon inventory for campus, and right now we're ready to have a discussion about waste being a very thin sliver of that carbon footprint. Um, yes, and actually there was a couple of years ago, there, internally within EPA there was a lot of discussion about whether landfills should be considered, uh, you know, where they should end up on the, as far as what their requirements would be. Um, obviously they give off methane, so they uh, have, you know, 20 times the impact of CO2. So um, from the materials management perspective and, and from um, trying to prevent waste from contributing, um, we have argued that um, landfills should be um, considered sources and should be regulated uh, for their methane. Is that, is that what you were asking? Is um, yeah, indirectly. Okay. Um, the, uh, the bigger portion I was kind of looking at was based on the report that I read, the embedded emissions of our stuff are actually bigger, car bigger carbon footprint than heating our homes or transportation, for instance. Mm -hmm. So then the question was raised, well, where is the line for us to draw on our carbon footprint as a university? Should we really be taking responsibility for the emissions of mining, for instance? Where, where is that line? So who should take the responsibility of cutting those emissions from the upstream process? Mm -hmm. I haven't talked about it. It's a really good question. Actually, I'm thinking about some of the things I've seen, some of the data I've seen on it. Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure I can actually answer the question at this point, but i um, be happy to talk more with you about it. Because um, I'm, yeah, it's a tough question. Is ways to energy kind of figure in sustainability in some way? Good question. I knew I was going to get this question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, and the hierarchy of, if you think about the hierarchy of materials, it's not at the bottom. You know, obviously landfilling and doing nothing if you're considering or landfilling it is at the bottom. Um, what we've said at EPA, what our position has been is um, obviously there are some things that I showed the pie chart of things that would still have potential or opportunity there for, for reuse or diverting from uh, landfills. I think there are some instances where that will be the best and highest use of the material. But I think that um, from our perspective, we'd like to see, um, you know, at least the, uh, making sure that there isn't a higher use before we um, move to waste energy. There's a lot of interest in waste energy and a lot of um, Places that want to jump in and, and do waste energy. I'm not sure how successful any of them have been, but it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of interest. Yeah. Does that help? Did I answer your question? That's EPA's perspective, is that it's not the. I, 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 I agree with the idea of the burning as much as possible. I think there will be, I mean, I think that in the future we will see some waste energy um, in, in um, if, if they can figure out the technology and actually make it work, and, um, we will see it. How much of it I think will depend on whether or not we have um, good solid technologies and um, ways to use materials, or, um, reuse materials and get to the point where waste energy is the best. Okay. I have a question. Oh, yeah. So, you know, 
uh, just coming in here, if you told me you were going to list the top 10, I would have thought, you know, somewhere on the list, you know, within your programs with regard to uh, fossil fuels, you know, and, and power plants. So you covered the, uh, the increasing uh, you know, mileage per gallon for vehicles, but, you know, I think that's great that, you know, we can do, you know, if, do you think about that, you know, in um, this context so of sustainability? Absolutely. And um, it's obviously it's it's um, energy efficiency and re reducing um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's I, I mentioned really briefly that I could talk on that subject for um, even longer, and I will say that um, the uh, conversation about climate and what what agencies doing and what um, you know what the administration's position has changed over time and um, politically there's been a lot of pressure on um, what the agency should be saying and not saying so I have to admit that I am um, not saying things about this because it really is still evolving you know, I'm trying to step around saying that um, we, we, we have not actually been given the go-ahead to get very um, into deep discussions about climate at this point, even though the agency is working towards that still, trying to figure out what's um, what the extent of the conversation. Sorry, I forgot over. <laughs> As a lack of capacity, so if there are people here in the audience are and they're interested in following through on some of these top 10 ways in which the agency is ahead, have all of that interest in those. What are the kinds of um, assistance or help they can expect from the um, Great, thank you for asking. So I had all those websites up there. So those, some of those are region five websites, some of those are uh, national websites, some of them are, some of them are not ours. Um, so you can always go to those websites to get more information. Um, do not hesitate to contact us. We um, do have grant programs. They're getting smaller <laughs> uh, over time. Um, we do have a lot of technical assistance that we provide in this area. And um, we also have a lot of um, networks that we can connect to with other people and other entities um, to help with um, your question or uh, connect you with people that have already worked on things. Um, like the asphalt project, for example, that was uh, Minnesota. And um, the person in Minnesota is a really good resource if you're thinking about um, looking into 